Ellis of North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. DeFord, where did you grow up in Antioch? Sorry, I grew up uh, between Priest Lake. I lived in Priest Lake for a while. Are you familiar? I, uh, I I grew up in Trailer Park on Richards Road. Went oh, to Antioch High School. Really? Class of but, 78. Yeah, we lived off, uh, We I, I was born in Bavaria Apartments off Haywood Lane. I think they call it Country Meadows now. Yeah, right yeah the, there, I lived uh, in Country Meadows at Hill one Creek. point. It's right next to Apollo Apartments, right next to Pop's old That's car exactly wash. Right. Yes, sir, I'm very I familiar with that Apollo trailer Junior park. Junior High School. I also had friends who got convicted for drug trafficking and had one commit suicide mm. uh, after uh, substance abuse uh, really took his life. But one thing I've noticed... Uh, one thing you said that I think is uh, very important, you uh, you said you see a lot of fights up here, and there are, uh, but there's some good stuff that happened. And one that I hope I can get you updated on is a bill that we passed last year called the Safer Communities Act, because I'm sure you know if you've looked at this the way I have, a lot of the people who are in addiction uh, are self-medicating. They, they get there because they have behavioral health problems. They have traumatic, they have trauma problems. They have a lot of challenges. We passed the bill last year on a bipartisan basis. Some of the folks on this committee voted for it. Others didn't, but it's working very well. Mm. Um, and it's helping expand behavioral health access. And we need help educating states like Tennessee, where I spent a lot of time now, I live in North Carolina, so that while we continue these fights, there's some good stuff that came out of this chamber on a bipartisan basis that will save life. So we, we won't spend time educating you on this, but I'd love to have the opportunity to educate you on this so that we can make sure it gets implemented well in Tennessee. I'm doing my part in North Carolina. Uh, but thank you for being here. I look forward to the opportunity to speak with you separately. I'd, I'd be honored. I, I believe that mental health and drug addiction go hand in hand. Um, we have we have this bill uh, that in a pilot form and uh, – and one of the states that implemented about 10 years or seven years ago, we had a 50% reduction in mental health incarcerations, 50% mm. reduction statewide. That says a lot about folks getting vectored into care that really makes a difference. So I'd, I'd like your help on uh, promoting that and look forward to meeting with you. Um, I also, uh, I also think we have to talk about the border talk. There is a fight going on right now on border security, and this is why you should be concerned with it. It looks like a fight. But we have cartels making about a billion dollars a year charging people a fare to get across the border, anywhere from $5,000 to $55,000 to come across the border illegally. They are making, according to the DEA, somewhere on the order of a billion dollars a year now. And they are plowing that money right into poisoning our country. They have these things called the Sinaloa Air, uh, Air Force, where they are taking ultralights and landing Coming across the southern border, landing, dropping off drugs, Senator Menendez is right. The majority of them are coming through legal ports of entry. Part of that can be fixed by technology, but a part of it can be fixed by actually having border patrol patrol the border and legal ports of entry versus being engaged in the millions of people coming across the border illegally. <laughs> we have to realize that we have to fix this and we have to interdict more drugs, and we do have to hold China and Mexico more accountable. Um, Mr. Urban. The, um, uh, the, the China, we, we have to continue to pound the drum that China is poisoning over 100,000 people a year. And as Mr. DeFord said, about 70% of them are likely dying from fentanyl. Um, but what more can we do to disrupt the money laundering? The cartels, the, the, the Mexican cartels don't launder money the way they used to. Now they call 1-800-CHINA, and, and they have a global network where they're laundering this money right before our very eyes. What sorts of policies should we take up to make that more difficult and disruptive? So I think there's, there's a couple of components there. One is we need to understand that we have home field advantage when it comes to money laundering, and, and what I'm talking about specifically within the domestic United States. Those bulk cash proceeds that I spoke about earlier are right here at specific points in time, but they always start right here within the United States. So we need to attack the networks and the money. It's the proceeds we don't focus on enough. That's, that's where the Mexican cartels and Chinese money launderers are vulnerable, right? That's where they're vulnerable. So in terms of attacking those networks, we need additional AML compliance and oversight. And it, is it because my t my time's limited, Mr. Yos? I'll, I'll submit some questions for the record for you because this, the, the, there's also a public safety issue with law enforcement. I'd like to get to. We're not going to have time, but isn't it also going to require? Uh, I'm not necessarily uh, 
big on regulations, but if we don't start figuring out the use of crypto and digital assets as a way of getting, of, of really masking the laundering activities, I think we're going to miss a lot of what's going on. Do you agree with that? So I certainly agree that crypto needs additional oversight and AML compliance. It's one component of the money laundering yeah. cycle that I spoke about. Okay. Well, thank you all. Mr. DeFord, I, I am sincere when I say I want to, well, it looks like we lived in the same trailer park. Uh, but we also have a common background, and I'm very, very serious. I need help educating people, not once and done. What we, we do here is you, <clears throat> excuse me, you pass a bill, and then you hope something happens. I want to make damn sure what happened in this, the five states that implemented, <clears throat> excuse me, implemented the Safer Communities Act happened in Tennessee and across the country. Yes, sir. You have a friend in me. I'd love to talk. Thank you. Mr. Ford, though it's not obvious, he graduated a, a little, a few years before you did. Yeah. It's also obvious he might be the only person in here as Southern as I am. <laughs> I don't think so, actually. <laughs> yes, yes, the guy sitting to your left and a few people up here.